السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome to the mothers of the believers In this episode inshallah we're talking about Safiya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab And Safiya radiallahu anha she was of the Jews of Medina So how did this woman become a Muslim and become one of the mothers of the believers, especially since her father and her uncle were severe enemies of Islam? We'll find out when we begin this episode, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Welcome to the Mothers of the Believers. As promised, today we're talking about Safiya, the daughter of Huyay ibn Akhtab. And Huyay ibn Akhtab, her father, he was uh, basically a leader of the Jews, but he was like almost like a king in his status and in his place with the Jews of Medina. Now the Jews of Medina, they were expecting a prophet to come, and they, were, they knew that it was the time of a new prophet to, to show up. But they were expecting that the Prophet would come from amongst them, that he would be from amongst the Jewish people. And so when the Prophet came from the Quraysh, from the Arabs, they were upset about that very much. So as with Juwayriya, Safiya radiallahu anha, she was married to the Prophet after the victory at Khaybar. And before, of that, she was, before that she was married to Salam ibn Mishkam. And then they were divorced. They said that they were inc incompatible, is what the books of history say. So she was married to Salam ibn Mishkam, but they were incompatible, so they became divorced. And then she married Kinana ibn al Rabi'. And it was after the, uh, the battle or the, or the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that they thought the Muslims were weak, and so they tried to. Uh, like they basically the, her tribe tried to invite all the, the neighboring Jews and other people to join forces and attack the Muslims. There were about 1400 in the army and they were going to attack the Muslims but the Muslims were actually camped right outside of their doorstep and they attacked, the Muslims attacked them, surprise attacked them right after Fajr so they started running to their homes and the leader Huyay ibn Akhtab was killed and the husband of Safiya radiallahu anha Kinana he was also killed. So now the Muslims just captured this entire tribe and captured a lot of wealth, all the women and children, the men, uh, all the, the livestock, all these things were captured. And it was narrated that Bilal was seen with two women and he was taking them through like all the dead people. Yeah, basically all after, at the end of the battle, he's got two women's, uh, women who are captives and he's pulling them through, he's like taking them, leading them through but he took them through the battlefield where they could see all the tribesmen and the, the relatives who were dead and killed. So one of them was screaming and shrieking and putting sand in her hair from seeing the dead people. The other was just silent in shock. The one that was silent was Safiya radiallahu anha, the daughter of their chief Huyay ibn Akhtab. And the one that was crying was her cousin. So then the Prophet ﷺ reprimanded Bilal. He said, Bilal, has Allah removed mercy from your heart that you let these two women pass by those of their menfolk, by, of their relatives who have been killed? Now, the interesting thing is, so that may seem to you like, well, the Prophet ﷺ didn't really yell at him. He just said to him, did Allah remove the mercy from your heart that you let these two women pass by their dead relatives? That's all he said. But the interesting thing is this, from the Prophet ﷺ, this is a severe rebuke because the Prophet ﷺ used to never fault people for what they do, even if it was a mistake. We have the very famous narration from Anas radiallahu anhu, where he said, I served the Prophet ﷺ for eight years. Not once did he ask me about something that I did, why did you do it? Not just yell, he'd never ever once in eight years asked him, why did you do this or why did you not do that? Not once. So the fact that the Prophet ﷺ says this to Bilal, it's actually a very strong rebuke from the Prophet ﷺ. Now the Prophet ﷺ then, <coughs> he told someone to take care of her cousin who was screaming and he recognized her being the daughter of their chief or almost their king. So the Prophet ﷺ put his garment over her and that was a, a, a sign that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he recognized her and he wanted her for himself. 
So this is one of the narrations. There are about three different narrations of how she came to be with the Prophet The first one, the Prophet put the government over her. The second one, that she actually, when the people were distributed, the prisoners of war were distributed, she fell to Dihya al-Kalbi radiallahu anhu, and the Prophet actually bought her from him. This is the second narration. The third narration is that the Prophet just took Safiya from Dihya al-Kalbi and, and he gave him some other captive in her place. But in any case, the Prophet ﷺ, he said to her, he said, choose. This is now the choice he's giving Safiya. So let's pay attention to the narration to see if there is any threat to her life, if she's forced to do anything or not, or if she's also uh, Jewish when she marries the Prophet ﷺ, as sometimes you hear speakers say the Prophet ﷺ had a Jewish wife. So let's listen. The Prophet said to her, choose. If you choose Islam, I will keep you for myself, meaning I will be married to you, you will be one of the mothers of the believers. And if you choose Judaism, then I will set you free to join your people. I mean, look at a choice like that. If you become a Muslim, you get married to the Prophet If you choose Judaism, I will set you free. So if she's someone who's already of Jewish origin, and she says, I choose my religion, then she just chose her freedom. And you might also be ask, asking, why is it that, uh, that the Muslims are capturing these prisoners of war? Part of it is that uh, the Muslims, when they would be captured, they would be put into slavery and so on and so forth. And so when they captured people, they also kept them as prisoners of war, and that kept it equal, just so that the Muslim prisoners of war are not like, uh, made as like, servants and workers, while there is no, nothing on the other side. So this is part of the, to keep it balanced. But here we see that the Prophet ﷺ now is going to come up with a way by which he will have all the Muslims free, all of the Jews that were just captured. Because it was especially unheard of that you just capture a tribe and then you let them go without ransom, without anything in return. In any case, let's go back to our story and we'll come back to her tribe being freed. So the Prophet uh, ﷺ gave her this choice and Safiya radiallahu anha said, The Messenger of Allah, I desire Islam. And I believed in you before you called me when I went to when I came to your riding animal. She says, I have no desire in Judaism, and I have neither a father nor brother in it. And father, I mean, family passed away. So she says, You give me a choice between disbelief and Islam. I prefer Allah and His Messenger in over returning to my people. So you might ask now, why did she so quickly accept Islam? Why was it so quickly that she immediately said, I choose Allah and His Messenger? And why was she saying Allah and His Messengers? She convinced already that the Prophet ﷺ is a genuine Prophet of Allah, and that He is the Messenger ﷺ. There is a reason behind that. As I said the first one, I said in the beginning of the episode, that the Jews of Medina, they were anticipating the arrival of a new Prophet, because their books had mentioned, and this basically looked like the time when the new Prophet is going to come, and they were hoping that this new Prophet would come from amongst themselves, but they were surprised that it would come from the Quraysh. This is the first reason. The second reason, and a very strong reason, something that happened when Safiya radiallahu anha was only 10 years old, something that made her convinced that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was a genuine Prophet. What that is, we'll find out when we come back from the break, inshallah. Alright, welcome back to the show. So we're talking about the, with the reasons that Joyri or, or, or Sophia, okay, not to confuse anybody, we're talking about the reasons how, why Sophia radiallahu anha so quickly decided to become a Muslim. The first reason, they were expecting a Prophet to show up. 
The second thing that happened when she was 10 years old, she describes it herself. She says, I was my father's favorite and the favorite of my uncle Yasser. And they could never see me without one of the, with one of their children without picking me up. So she was their favorite. Every time all the kids were there, they would pick up Safiya radiallahu anha and they would greet her. She says, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa came to Medina, my father and uncle, they went to see him. And it was early in the morning between dawn and sunrise, and they did not return until the sun was setting. So they spent the whole day, her father and her uncle, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She says, when they came back around the time of sunset, they were walking very slowly, they were very depressed. She says, I came to them and I smiled as I always did. But they did not take any notice of me. They didn't pay attention to me. And they looked like, you know, in a miserable state. Then she says, I heard Yasir ask my father, Is it him? And his, her father, Ibn Akhtab, he said, Yes, it is. So then he said, Is it the messenger or is he the messenger of Allah? And he said, Yes. So Yasir said, her uncle said, How did you know him? Her father said, I recognize him very well. He has all the signs. So now he's saying, is it really the messenger? And his, her father saying, yes. He said, how did you know? He said, he has all the signs. I recognize him extremely well. So then he, Yasir asked him, so what have you decided to do? And her father says, I have decided to fight him abad al dahr for all eternity. I'm going to fight against him. So how, how, what, what kind of wickedness is this? He sees all the signs and all the evidences and he's sure that this is the awaited messenger, but he rejected him. And he goes, he's going to fight against him, even though he recognized this is the Prophet sent by Allah Azza wa Jal. So then, Safiya radiallahu anha, even though she was 10 years old, she says, فَوَقَعَ فِي نَفْسِي مِنْ ذَلِكَ or, or, or مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْوَقْتِ She says, so it, it kind of like it hit me from that time. And, and she, كَيْفَ يَكُونْ هُوَ النَّبِيُّ وَيَكْرَهُونَ How could it be that he's the Prophet and they hate him? So this is something that has affected her since that time, she says. How can he be the Prophet and they hate him so much? Didn't make any sense. So this is uh, another reason. A third reason is that she saw a dream that we've mentioned before and that we'll keep mentioning. She saw a dream in which the moon came and it fell onto her lap. It's also narrated that when the Prophet ﷺ married her, there was like a greenish mark near her eye, a greenish colored mark near her eye. And so uh, when uh, the, that mark was basically that because after she saw this dream, she told it to her mother. She says, I saw the moon come from Yathrib. The moon came from Medina, Yathrib, and fall into my room. This is uh, the dream. That the moon came out of Medina and fell into her room. So when she told this dream to her mother, her mother hit her. And that was that greenish mark. He hit her. She says, you, you're like you're hopeful to marry the, the king of the Arabs, meaning you're hopeful that you want to marry the Prophet ﷺ. So her mother hit her. And uh, basically, and now I'm going to go back a little bit to when her mother and father, they had her married to Kinana. She was about uh, 11 years old. And now when he passes away, she's about 17 years old. And she was wed to the Prophet ﷺ when she was about 17 years old. This is just to give you an idea of how young she was. So again, it goes back to the description of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of them were under 20, some of them were in their 20s, some were in their 30s, and some of them were over the, that, that number. So Islam first enters her heart when she was about 10 years old. Then she gets that vision, and that's why when the Prophet ﷺ asked her immediately, she was so willing, and they were married when I, she was 17 years old. This was the seventh year after the Hijrah, and the Prophet ﷺ at the time was 60 years old. So she was a young girl. And because she was young, sometimes things would, issues would arise between her and the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And others of the, amongst them were young as well. And so uh, just out of jealousy, they might say something to her that would hurt her feelings. So one time, they called her daughter of a Jew. So this was what they said to her. He said, they told her, you daughter of a Jew or you Jewess, you know, you know, a Jewish woman. So basically, I mean, obviously she, is, she's become, uh, she was a Muslim, so they called her daughter of a Jew, uh, just to spite her or something of that sort. Maybe some jealousy happened. So then she went crying to the Prophet ﷺ, because she was a young girl. So she was crying to the Prophet ﷺ. They said, she said, some of your wives called me daughter of a Jew. 
So he said, why don't you respond to them? And she said, with what shall I respond? And here we see the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ in fixing these kinds of issues, these kinds of problems. So she, he said to her, respond to them. She said, with what shall I respond? He said, tell them my husband is a prophet and my father is Aaron and my uncle is Musa. So I'm the wife of a prophet and the daughter of a prophet because she really was from the lineage of Harun alayhi salam. So I'm the wife of a prophet, the daughter of a prophet and my uncle is a prophet. فَمَن مِن كُنَّا لَهَا ذَلِكَ So which of you has this honor? This is how the Prophet ﷺ fixed, just told her something to say to them. And of course, they will never try to find any, any fault with her like this. And she can be linked to three of the Prophets of Allah and some of the great Prophets of Allah. So of course, after that, none of them will try to, uh, to ever say you're the daughter of a Jew or anything of that sort. And especially since she uh, accepted Islam. So this is how the Prophet ﷺ, uh, fixed things and this is how the Prophet ﷺ, fixed problems. And of course, if this were ha to happen today, someone who has co-wives and they fight like that, immediately what he's going to do is going to take out his belt and then you know they take the belt away from him and then there is a big, a huge problem. But the Prophet ﷺ used to fix things in such a nice way. And uh, he, he also though, he used to be strict with any of his wives who mocked her or made fun of her or called her Jew, you know, like say, tried to say your, your lineage is Jewish or something of that sort. But uh, like I said, these things just would happen at the, the moments of jealousy and so on and so forth. But in general, they, there wasn't like animosity amongst the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. But she lived for f uh, four years with the Prophet ﷺ and she remained uh, part of the social and the political life of Medina for 39 years after the Prophet ﷺ had passed away. Of course, uh, there are a lot of incidents or specific incidents that we want to mention. One of them has to do with Uthman radiallahu anhu when the, the people of Fitna came and they besieged him in his home and there were armies that were coming. This was later on, of course, during the reign of Uthman. So there were armies that were coming from all, around, all over the regions of the empire to support the Khalifa. And these people had besieged him in his home. They were hoping that Uthman would die before these armies would come and then they would be killed. So one way they thought to kill him was to prevent him from water. And so they said no one can bring water to the Khalifa and they didn't let him drink. And of course, as you know, especially in hot, dry Arabia, three days with no water is enough to kill a human being. Just three days with no water. And so, uh, Uthman عنه, was prevented from water. So Safiya عنها, she immediately saw that there's something she could do here. So she took some water with her and the people opened the path for her. But then one of the people of the fitna, he stood in her way and he said, Ila ain. He said, where are you going? She said, I am Safiya, Umm al muminin the mother of the believers, Safiya. And I want to enter upon the Amir of the believers. I want to enter upon Uthman. So he said, what are you carrying? And she didn't answer, so he uncovered and he saw that she was carrying a pot of water. And uh, let's take the narration from the narrator, his name was Kinana. He says, I was leading Safiya radiallahu anha to defend Uthman, meaning to assist Uthman. And then Al-Ashtar al nukhai he met her and he struck the face of her mule until it turned aside. In another narration, it ran with her and it, had it not been for people who stopped the animal, it, she would have fallen off the animal. But the great thing that she says, she says, take me back, this one will not disgrace me. I won't let this person disgrace me. That's a very, very important thing and an important thing for, uh, for all the, the sisters today. Where I'm going to explain what that means when we come back from the break, inshallah. Hajj, the journey of Ibrahim alayhi salam, is geared as an educational documentary that will take the audience through the footsteps of Ibrahim and the Muslims today as they perform the once in a lifetime journey of Hajj. The story is told by some of our well-known scholars of today as they reveal the importance and significance of the Muslims Hajj and how it relates to the journey of the father of religions, Ibrahim.
All right, welcome back to the show. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, wa rasulillah. So we're talking about Safiya radiallahu anha when Uthman was being besieged in his home. They prevented water from him. So she tried to get water to him. But Al-Ashtar al-Nukhi, it is said, he stopped her when he saw that she had water. He, he, in one narration, he broke the pot. In another narration, he hit the face of her riding animal and the animal ran away with her. And had it not been for the people to stop it, it would have, she would have fallen off of it. But the interesting thing, and the other is that, you know, he hit the animal, the animal turned to its side, like meaning turned like a, you know, what, 90 degrees. So then she said, take me away or take me back. This person will not disgrace me. What does that mean? So she's basically saying that, you know, she's going to remain dignified. And she's not going to stoop down to a level of someone like that who is not even respecting the mothers of the believers. And he, he would, if she you know, stays there and argues with him, he might say to her things that would not be befitting. And this is then an excellent, excellent example and an excellent uh, like a role model for all the women today. Simply because the mother of the believers, Safiya radiallahu anha, she didn't want to be disgraced by this person. She didn't want him to say things to her in public and she wanted to keep her dignity. This is so important for sisters to do because today, um, perhaps due to the over-exaggerated sense of the, of the radical, radical feminist movement, not the other feminist movement, but the radical one, where it's all about challenging the male, why should I run away from him, he should run away from me. And that's why a lot of sisters will get into fights with men in public. And the man, his sister should never do that. An irrespectable believing woman should never get into a fight with a man in public. Because the man will start to use very disgusting and very dirty words. And then sometimes you find women responding in, with in dirt, in dirty words to these men in public in response but this is not the proper way for the believing woman to behave. Of course, it's not the proper way for the man to behave. But it's not going to be any, any worse for him, but for the woman to do something like this in public, to fight with a man, to st stand there while he insults her, while he says uh, things of a very disrespectful nature to her. It's not for her to lower herself to this level, to lower herself to this low standard. And here it brings us uh, something important about basically um, haya. you know haya is this having this bashfulness being shy you know being modest in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet ﷺ said al haya shu'bah min al-iman that haya is one of the branches of iman and the interesting thing is that you know uh, a lot of sisters sometimes they lose their haya because they say I don't want to be afraid of the man why should I be afraid of him why should I move if he's coming out of the road? Why doesn't he move? Why, if he's staring at me, I'll stare him back until he puts his head down. No, no. We don't want you to be afraid of the man. And we didn't say you should be afraid of the man. But you shouldn't lose your haya in trying to get back your rights. You should never leave your dignity because, you know, in trying to get back your, you know, some, he insulted you, you want to insult him back before leaving so it's even. No. And this is so important. And this is something we learn from Safiya radiallahu anha. She's the mother of the believers. When this man didn't respect her position, she immediately left. Because he doesn't respect her position. He's already hitting her riding animal. He might do something worse the next time. So again, for you, the believing woman, when a man doesn't respect your position as a, a believing woman who is a chaste, who is modest, who is well covered, if he doesn't respect that position of yours, then you can expect him to go to worse levels with you. So do not put yourself in that situation. Do not fight with men. Do not exchange insults with men. Remember the hadith, the famous hadith of when the Prophet ﷺ, he passed by a man who was admonishing his brother. He was telling his brother, don't have too much haya. Maybe he's telling him, be a little aggressive. Maybe he's telling him, fight for your rights a little bit. Maybe he's telling him, be a little blunt with people. The Prophet ﷺ tells this man who is giving the advice, he tells him, leave him. Because haya is part of Iman. He tells him, leave him because Haya is part of Iman. So this is someone advising someone else to just, not to be a, like rude to people, but just maybe a little bit more assertive or maybe a little bit more like, uh, you know, uh, abrasive. Maybe abrasive is too strong. But in any case, he's not telling him to overstep his bounds. But yet the Prophet is saying, leave him, Haya is part of Iman. And so what then kind of advice can we give for the women? 
You know from the Haya of Aisha radiallahu anha was that when the Prophet ﷺ was buried in her home and then Abu Bakr was buried in her home, she would say, it's my father and my husband. So she would not cover too much or, or have to put on her hijab. She said, when Umar was buried next to them, I could not stay in the room without wearing hijab out of haya from Umar. So this is your mother, Aisha radiallahu anha, your role model, the mother of the believers. She has so much haya that she can't not wear hijab in front of a man who has passed away, he's dead, not only that, he's under the ground, even if he, and if he wasn't dead, he couldn't see her. Dead and under the ground, she said, I couldn't enter my own room without proper clothing out of haya from Umar. So haya is one of the aspects that a sister should guard, guard very much and not lose. And this is something that we learned in this story with Safiya radiallahu anha. So uh, in the end, uh, she was 21 years old, only 21 years old when the Prophet ﷺ died. And she died in the year 50 after the Hijrah, some books say up to 52 after the Hijrah. And she was buried in the famous uh, cemetery or the garden of Baqi' during the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu anha. Uh, radiallahu anhu. And she was noble by birth and noble by nature. She was God-fearing, she was very intelligent. And she was very beautiful. And this is again, she was extremely beautiful and extremely intelligent. And uh, she was very tolerant and very dignified. She cared about her dignity as I was just speaking. And what an important thing that is for all sisters to guard their dignity, to not allow anyone to debase them or to lower them, especially, especially if this is done publicly. And the reason I mentioned the radical feminist movement is that in this movement, it's all about challenging the male. I mean, this is not actually uh, the akhlaq of uh, the, the believing woman to be want uh, to want to like challenge the male and to exchange insults and even though this is kind of now uh, it's what is becoming uh, popular. And women use bad words in public and things of that sort. These are all not from the actions of believing women and definitely not from the actions of the mothers of the believers. So with that, we come to the end of the life of Safiya radiallahu anha. And uh, we hope that uh, you enjoyed this episode and you know Safiya radiallahu anha a little bit more. So until the next episode, I would like to thank you for being an excellent audience. Wa sallallahu wa barik ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil'alameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.